if you are steady at everything you do and keep moving forward, then eventually you're going to reach what you want to, you know. Yeah. Consistency. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what it is. I think that's the answer. Just beating the drum every day. Yeah. Chop wood, carry water. You heard of that book? <laughs> yeah. You have? If he would have just done it the right way the first time, like he would have been that good of a lawyer sure. legally. Yeah. So like sometimes instead of taking the shortcuts to try to get where you want to be, you're going to have that major setback because you didn't take all the proper steps. Well, so first of all, we're fresh out of the ice bath. We are. Which you're an old pro at, apparently, because you jumped in like it was no no big thing. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Feeling pretty good about it? Yeah. Well, I was feeling pretty good about it until until I ice bathed with you, and then I realized, like, I got a ways to go for my ice tolerance. Yeah. I almost think we should have just, you know, ice bathed in the podcast type. A little Kevin Hart action <laughs> <Yeah>. right there. <laughs> what's his uh, What's his segment call? I don't know. Uh Something with Kev. Yeah. Icing with Kev. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's a little too cold, though. Yeah. We probably could have powered through it. You you could have. You could have. You definitely could have. Yep. It's, uh, so the last time you did an ice bath was high school or it was college? High school. Did you spend a, a whole a whole year in college? Was it one year or was it? Um, It was actually, I only played college football for one semester mm -hmm. and then the second semester of my college career uh was kind of the whole covid situation so that's when they sent us home rather than just said we're not doing everything's online basically yeah yeah, yeah i actually remember like the whole covid deal going out on the news and then it kind of was on the news for like a week and no one really made a big deal about it and then i kind of feel like it just got blown up and before you know it we were moving home and all classes were online and 2020 yeah in the heat of it right yeah yeah right on so then shortly after that you figured out like hey i can make a career a life a living without a four year degree yeah i actually came back home and then got to talking to some of my high school buddies um so i actually went to iowa state for a year when i got back and completely switched my degree right i was pre med Pre-med, chiropractic school. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. How the world changes. How the world changes. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, started out in the kinesiology and all that stuff at Iowa State. And then it, like two weeks after class started, it was like your deadline if you were going to switch classes. Um, and I just, I don't know. I woke up one morning. I'm like, this isn't it. So. Sure. I. Uh, just like that, like one morning. I mean, it was. A progressive thing. but Kind of like from the time school started that first, and I was transitioning into a Iowa State. Obviously, it's a lot bigger than being a Vista. So I was going from class sizes of, you know, 10 to 15 kids to, you know, hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. So, Big auditoriums. Yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't really all about that at first. No. Um, not really a people person, maybe. Large crowds. Um, so then I... Okay, so Sydney, Sydney, hey Sydney, she's right there. She's making a face like Bryce just said he's not a people person. Sydney strongly disagrees by that face. Well, right it's there. not that I don't like people; I just don't like being in big crowds. Sure, that's different, right? That's yeah. different. By the way, you can totally th turn off my Dirk Bentley. I'm uh, on a hard Dirk Bentley kick right now, <laughs> but uh, he, his time is over. His, his time is not for right now on the podcast. Yeah, you happy with that? I don't know where to turn that off. Is that just on? Oh, just hit the, it's on Apple Music there on the computer. Sorry. But, um, yeah, you're a people person. I mean, part of the reason why, I mean, we go way back. Yeah. I mean, we go way back now. You know, it's we're probably, a couple of young guns, but. What is that? Probably four, five years now? Since you spent a, a summer. summer with you. Four or five years ago? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a great summer when you interned at my chiropractor office there. It was but, a good uh, time. If it didn't require time. eight years of school, I'd probably still be doing it. It's a, it's a, it's a long, it's a long, lonely road sometimes that road uh, to be in a chiropractor. But every time we've gotten together, we, we end up talking deep about life, about stuff. So like I, you're certainly a people person, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say. Yeah, but big crowds is a different, yeah. different thing in a classroom setting. Right. When you want access to a teacher or a professor and it's not available. Right. You, where you have to work for it, you yeah. know, where you might want to like go catch the professor after class, but there's 20 other people who want to do the same thing. Like you just, you right. just necessarily can't. I haven't talked to many people. Lindsay's here. Yeah. You I, went to Iowa State. I did. You had big class sizes. Uh, My freshman year, yeah. Yeah. After that, in design school, it's pretty small. Gets niche. It does, yeah. So if you wanted to talk to a professor, you could you could get that. I Yeah, I could. That was pretty easy once I got into studio classes. But like freshman year, when it was everybody, there's like 180 kids trying to talk to the same yeah. teacher. I was going to say, though, like that's the biggest difference. After I decided that that path was not for me, um, I guess I decided that turf and landscaping was. Um, and I honestly still try to think about like why that would have drove me that direction. I mean, obviously my parents have a family owned company, um, in Jefferson and the, raccoon Valley lawn care. Yeah. You betcha. And, uh, I never thought that I would come back and do this just because growing up, that's all I knew. I mean, that's what we did as a family. You um, mowed, you cut mowed, grass, move snow, you know, all that good stuff. And sometimes I wonder, like, why it did drive me to want to do this. Um, and I still don't have an answer for it. But I think it's because I enjoy being around my family and spending time with my family. Um, and it gives me the flexibility now, um, having my own family, that I feel like it is, it's nice. It's convenient, you know. Hazel, your own family, like, yeah. you got a newbie. <laughs> I do. You've got a two-week-old kiddo. Two weeks. Almost four. Almost four weeks. I'm behind the times. Yeah, Tuesday's and, four. Wow. Yeah. Right on. Which we'll get into that too on the whole, uh, that whole experience of childbirth and yeah. starting your own family. But it's helpful when your family, like your your siblings, your mom, grandma, grandpa are available to like help out with the kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine being in a town like by yourself with a, with a kid and like not necessarily having that immediate family connection just... Me growing up with my parents down the road too, I feel it's it's a blessing. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so when I did decide to go to turf, it was actually really nice because all my class sizes went from huge to shrunk. And then you start building the connections with your professors. And actually, funny enough, um, last year I haven't been at Iowa State for three years now. Three years. Yeah. And uh, last year I got a phone call from a random phone number. I didn't know who it was, so I answered it, and it was actually a professor of mine at when I was at Iowa State. So they had uh, just redone the high school football field, and they were struggling with the sod issues and oh, wow. and all that. And, uh, yeah, he called me, and he's like, are you still in Jefferson? <laughs> yeah. He's like, well, I, I need to meet you out there and see, you know, what your ideas are, you know, how can we help the school get their football field back together. So I thought that was kind of cool, you know, you go from a big university and really I didn't have that big of a connection with him, but it was just enough, like he remembered me. So I yeah. think that that's kind of an important takeaway from being there. Did you tell him that you were like quitting college to go home and start or work on the business? Well, or yeah, it was he... actually, um, so it was the end of a semester um, and then we started, we hadn't quite started the next semester. Um, but I was in his research class, um, and I actually had an internship lined up for that for the summer. Um, and it was through some, I don't remember who it was now, but it was some uh, like construction company that actually builds new fields. Um, football fields. Football fields, soccer fields, I mean, all that. They actually were the ones that built the new walkie complex. Right on. So uh, they are big and... I was kind of talking to him about it. Like I was excited for this internship. And then I just, I was like, I'm going to go do my own thing. That's perfect opportunity. I mean, they always, I feel like in that industry, it's more of the experience you can get. Like classroom work was more of, um, they just prepared you for test. That's what I felt like. Like they told you the information you needed to know for a test, but really our involvement in their research farm um, at Iowa State, and that's where they grew the sod for Jack Trice. And, I mean, wow. they, they do a lot out there, um, a lot of testing, a 
um, on different soils, um, different fertilizers, all that stuff. So they always said like the field experience was most important. And I thought, I mean, if I want to go start building retaining walls and doing all the big landscaping stuff, then why am I here? If I need the experience, sure. No. So I feel like that kind of drove me that direction. You just, a light bulb went off about what you really needed to have a successful career doing this. And you just, that's a, that's one thing I really wanted to get into is what you would tell a high schooler now, you know, if you're a sophomore, junior, senior, trying to figure out what you want to do, everyone's going to college. I mean, there was a phase where it's like everyone went to that secondary education, right? Would you tell someone, yes, go to college? Or would you tell them to find a niche, a niche employment where there's a need and be the best at it and then just go do that? What would you, what would your advice be? Um, I think that's a hard question because I do think you're right that there was a, uh, like, I don't know, what do you call it, a stigma? That you're supposed yeah, to go to college. Totally. Like, go through it all. Um, and I think anymore, though, that the school system itself is doing a good job of um, allowing kids to actually find their niche while they're in high school. And I think that kind of gears them up mo- more for the real world to be like, if you're not going to go to college and you don't want to go to college and you figure that out at an early time, I mean, that gives you more of an opportunity to get those skill sets um, to do what you want to do instead of kind of wasting that time, even though you know that you don't want to go to college. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of those trades are becoming a lot more popular, and I think they're, like, not pushing but allowing these kids to actually, you know, find what they want, love and want to do. See, the career academy out here that we have is yeah, a, a I good think idea. It's great. A yeah. great idea, yeah. I think so, too. Brett Abbott's was on two episodes ago, yeah. and he, I think he... If I was ever on the fence, which I didn't know that I was, but if I was, I'm no longer on the fence. Like it's a good, it's a good idea. Yeah, I it's, think. Yeah, I think he's doing a lot of good things for our kids. I think so too. It's, they, he said it's the highest enrollment ever for the career, career academy. Yeah, which is big too, since COVID kind of slowed the the growth down. But now it's like, yeah, it's giving kids the experience, the hands on experience yep. to do the thing that, like, there's some of those jobs, some of the tradesman jobs, and the other things. Like they're never gonna. They're never going to go out of style, you know, like right. you ask anyone who's trying to build something right now, you need carpenter, you need plumbers, you need electricians. Like we're short right. on all of that yep. in little old Jefferson, Iowa. There's a demand for those types of jobs, right? So I imagine there's a demand everywhere. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially uh, I've got to work more in the bigger cities, Grimes, and a lot of those really, mm, I mean, the population is just they're expanding. Yeah. Like they're just always changing, keep growing. And I mean, there's signs up everywhere looking for just, I mean, your laborers, um, your special trades. I mean, I think all that, I don't think it's ever going to stop. Yeah. To build things. It's like you, you can't automate construction. Right. Necessarily. They're trying, but you can't. Yeah. Oh, I've seen like, have you seen the, like 3D printed homes. Yeah, the ones that 3D like print concrete homes. Concrete yeah. homes, yeah. They say like you, they can build a home in like five days. I have not seen this. Yeah. This is tickling my brain a little bit. Oh, I, the idea of a 3D printer, I have not wrapped my brain around, around yet either. Like how do you, do you have any idea how one of those works? No. Like how I, do you. I don't. It's I all, can kind of tell you. It's how do you like, 3D print <laughs> concrete? I mean, but it's isn't they just put it like in a CAD system and yes. like they just design it on paper and the software is smarter than you and I. <laughs> well, so it's like you would go to school for like architecture or or you could do general construction if you want to be like a guy that draws up blueprints. That is what you would do. And then you'd take those blueprints, put them into CAD. And then import that project into the 3D printer software, and then it will just do it. Just does it. You just same. tell it what like medium you want it to use. So like for smaller things, you'd use plastic, and you just feed in the type of plastic that you'd like to use. But for these bigger ones, you're just it's you're like it's concrete, <laughs> and then you feed in the concrete. That's what I I need. I need a picture, <laughs> or a diagram, or something. <laughs> I just because when I print something at my office, yeah. That printer is loaded with paper and ink. Right. And if I don't have paper and ink, ain't nothing coming out of there. 
So it's like, how do you 3D print something without the elements that you're trying to make? So well, what are the you elements? You have the ground of, and you have the concrete. So you have the concrete. So the, like, gr- the ground wh- is the paper and the concrete's the ink. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just dumping like bags of concrete into this no, thing? No, they're put, like, I'm pretty sure it's like full blown concrete trucks. I mean, yeah. If you're building it, a whole yeah. house, sure, sure, it, sure. Yeah. it takes a lot of concrete, but. And like this, this stuff will run. Sometimes they do it in phases. So they'll do like the foundation, let it all dry, and then they'll do the next level of the house and let it all dry. Sure. Yeah, I actually and thought at one point like Iowa State had uh, like talked about doing their own. I'm sure home, they did. Like building a couple of them or whatever. For yeah, I'd I'd be interested in seeing yeah. all of that sort of stuff. I there's Amazon Homes now. Are huh? there really? I want to say it was like sixty eight grand. You could buy like a a little Amazon, a tiny house. But yeah. it, probably bigger than your average tiny house, if you remember that show from yeah. way back when. Bigger than that. It was two levels, fancy glass, nice black facade around it, and at Amazon, oh, you know. Next they day sh- delivery? Or? I probably <laughs> <depends on. laughs> Maybe not around here, but you go to a city, I bet you get it real fast, you know. And That's and then nuts. all the components, and you put it together, and it's almost like a Lego house. Like, it just snap, it snaps together, was my interpretation oh. of it. That which, sounds, like, not safe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right i uh, yeah maybe they ship each component on like a truck and then you just have to like place it place it together and maybe. then like is it a new idea of like the modular homes yes yes like I something think so. like that yeah that's know? interesting yep which i mean cheap simple easy i mean what more do you yeah. need if you're in a temporary place or if you're in like a that would work really well if you like bought land that you wanted to build on but weren't quite ready to build the house. Yeah. You just needed somewhere to live for a couple of years yeah. and then you could. But I feel like you it. still have all the other expenses in it. You don't have right. water. You don't have sewer. You don't have. Somehow you have to hook all that like up. Like somehow yeah. you, they, they don't just come fully plumbed. <laughs> right. Someone's going to have to finish the that The electricity job. is just Correct. not Someone's done. You've got to you've hook it all up to the, the, the utilities at hand, but. Right, so can you go put a house in the middle of the woods? I suppose not. You're using an outhouse and you're pumping water from the local creek, I guess. But yeah, I mean, run on solar panels, I guess. I and that's maybe true. that's part of it. Yeah, maybe that's part of it. I suppose. The world's changing. It is. The world's changing. That was my last question for you. I'm gonna hold <laughs> off on that. I think my question. Maybe we'll just. I don't know. Maybe we'll touch it a couple times. This is the question I'd like to ask. This st- give give your state of the union of our culture right now. How do you think things are going? What impressions do you have about our our culture? I guess it depends who you ask. I'm asking Bryce Hoyle right now. <laughs> 23, um, 23 year old Bryce Hoyle. 23 year old self made. I think uh, JJ technically made you. JJ yeah. and Teresa made you. So <laughs> That's true. kudos, Hoyle parents. Thank you for bringing this creature onto the earth. I, I think it's more boils down to uh, you don't really think about it until it matters. Um, like, yeah, I'm only 23 years old. What, what difference does it make to me? And I think that's where having your own family comes to be a different play. Cause now you're not worried about yourself. Um, and you're not thinking like, you know, if you look back and you think, oh, how's the school system? I'm like, I don't know. I already been through it. Why is, you know, why does it matter? But you start your own family and now you're thinking, you know, how's this gonna affect my child growing up um i think the world is changing because i just feel that younger the younger generation has become so attached to um the media um social apps stuff like that like yeah i was involved in that stuff too um growing up but i feel as if they're starting to use the media to make the kids believe certain things like really because they know it's there like they know kids are using it it's like i don't know how many 12 year olds have iphones right (laughs) too many i mean like what's the purpose of it give them a flip phone i mean i mean if you want to call them then you have their phone number that's all they need yep right at that age and i think that since all these young kids have them and they don't know what to think or what to believe or not believe. I feel like the media is just hammering it on them, you know, and it's persuasive because they're they're good at what they do. They make a lot of people believe a lot of things, and you don't know if it's true or not. Indeed. 
and all these apps are suggesting things for you. Right. We think you might be interested in this because of what you looked at before or now what, I mean, who's to say they're not slipping in something a little extra, you know, something suggests like, yeah. And this, I, is, this yeah. is what we want you to think in a way. That's why I think it's hard because it's like at, you look back and like in your 12 year old days, what if you believed it? I mean, how do you know what's the difference between right and wrong unless your parents teach you that? Right. I right, mean, right. And now the parents are battling with social media because social media says one thing, you know, the parents still have their morals and, and it's like you're battling. Yeah, you're battling. I feel like it's an endless battle. Mm-hmm. It is. I wonder if that's what our parents would say if they if they felt like it was a battle between what they're teaching and what society is pumping in into right. us, you know. I'm sure that's always been it's always been the case. Yeah. It harder now. I feel like it is. Yeah. You've got that social media imposing yeah. ideas to you constantly. Yeah. Right. I think I had my first iPhone when I was 21. I was in chiropractor school. I had an iPhone 5. Is what I had. I actually will never forget. I mean, my parents would be pretty upset me saying this, but <laughs> I remember all my friends in school always had smartphones. Like, I don't know why, but like the BlackBerry. Like, that was the thing. Yep. You had to have one. <laughs> and my parents never would get me one. So I remember like working on the farm and stuff, and we'd have all these collection of flip phones. And uh, like one day I was like climbing up in the barn, and I'm like, I want a BlackBerry. So I just dropped the phone. Ooh. <laughs> like, Mom, I broke my phone. Do you think I can get a BlackBerry now? She's like, opens the drawer. Uh, looks like we got another flip phone here. <laughs> yeah. So my parents never really gave in to that, you know, what yeah. we wanted. They're like, you don't need it. You don't so, need it. Yeah. Right. That was kind of the thing. It's like, not that we don't want you to be able to have it. It was like, you don't need it. Not right it's now. It's not necessary. Yeah. Right. Looking back, do you appreciate they did that? I do because I think it makes you appreciate the smaller things. Like when they did get that for us, I felt like it was you appreciated it because you know that they didn't have to do it. Um, And it wasn't like so much that they wanted to do it either. It was just like to satisfy us, maybe Mm -hmm. to show them that like we've earned it. Um, So I think it that's kind of that's special. Yeah. I like that. That's how I look at it anyway. I think it sounds like. Your parents were very logical, very, uh, very level-headed parents, or would you say? Well, and I, I think a lot of it is, is like either my parents grow up with a lot either. Like both their families wor- have worked their whole lives and continue to work. And um, like, I feel like they both, both sets of them like went through struggles at points. So I think they really appreciated, you know, what they have now, mm-hmm. what they've worked for. Mm-hmm. So I think that goes a lot you know hand in hand with everything it does and so i mean you obviously uh how one question is like if someone wanted to do what you're doing with landscaping and building walls and all this like did where how would they learn how would they start it's like bryce i want to be like you what do i do honestly i think the best thing you can do is like put yourself in that environment um there's landscapers every day with not enough help like it's it's a hard manual labor job it's it's physical it's not easy um but i think that if you want to to do that i think anyone's willing to show you how you know so like if you were to just go work for somebody um that was in that field and gain that experience uh, i think you're going to be a lot farther ahead than just trying to go right into it and figure it out as you go. Um, just because there's a lot of liability behind it. I mean, if you build a wall and it falls and it's on you. So it's a, a risk of safety, obviously. Right. And just a risk of if that wall falls, do you have the money to, you know, kind of eat it? <laughs> Crazy. I mean, you, I mean, that's what you'd have to do is you just have to eat that money right. and, and start over, eat your time to go yeah. rebuild it. Should have got some pictures uh, of stuff that you've built. Cause I've seen a couple of things and it does baffle my mind when I think about when I try to put myself in your position, like how would I do that? Yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea. 
Like where you even get, where you get rock from, where do you get rock from? You know, just things that are like basic to you, but yet like it's such a, such a niche, such a skill. Like, yeah. And I feel like it's, it's a more of a process, you know, than anyone really takes in con- consideration because it's like, you don't just show up and like throw this wall up and walk away. Just throw some like, stone on the ground yeah, and say, like, yeah, looks good. We're out of here. You right. know what? There's a process of getting the material, buying the material, figuring out. I mean, there's hundreds of different materials to be used. So it's just, what does your customer want? You know, what look are they going for? Do they want a natural look? Do they want it to be like more of a modern industrial look? Like there's just so many options that if I walked up to you and I just threw you three different product books and been like, all right, pick your best one, favorite one. You couldn't do it because there's just, comes down to like what like I said the style that you're going for the I mean there's just so many different textures of block there's different sizes of block there's I mean it's 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 crazy world crazy world so I mean like I always try to just feel them out right away and before we even talk about materials obviously just see the like size of the job what they're kind of going for you know are they doing it just to hold a hillside or are they doing it you know to get the the looks out of it. Um, because there's retaining walls that definitely don't have to be built that people build anyway, just for the aesthetics of it. Um, yeah, but you got to figure all that out. You got to figure out what you're going for before you even figure out the material. I mean, that's the biggest yeah. thing. So how often will you be, uh, like building a wall, working away and you'll get like a first responder call and then you're like off, like trying to get to an accident or a scene of something. So I feel like it's hard right now because the first like year, Probably me building walls. Um, I was more localized. Um, I did a lot of work around here. So it was convenient. I mean, it was easy for me. Like, if we got a call, I know that, like, firefighting-wise, you know, it's volunteer. So getting that day help is hard. So I was always around. Um, so it kind of always worked out. And, I mean, now I'm 45 minutes or an hour from home most days. So I feel like something like that goes across. You're just like, well, you know, if it's nothing major or nothing big, I just kind of have to just push it to the yeah. side, you know, because I can't afford to drive an hour to go to a fire scene to drive an hour back to right. work. Right. Um, Sydney, first responder too. She is firefighter and everything. Yeah. Right. Yes. And your dad's your dad's on that. Been for a long time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just volunteer. Yeah. yeah. Right on. That's uh. Are there more fires? Have there been a, a higher rate of fires recently than the last couple of years? Or I don't know. What do you think? Not really. I feel like it's actually went down. I feel like my first six months on the department was like crazy because it was the co-op explosion. Landis? Yeah, some of those big things in my first year that made it seem like there was a lot of fires. But sure. I don't know. I feel like it's a good thing not to be be busy with fire department very good (laughs) correct very good i feel like we just know more people that have like their houses or garages have caught on fire recently maybe that's it that we feel like it's probably more but i'm glad that it's lower than typical indeed (laughs) finally paying attention to those things and you know people or it's yeah you understand how devastating a fire is and I, i guess i i don't i never understood how often it actually happened it seems like there's been like several house fires Recently. Yeah, I think probably recently it's been a little higher, but I don't think it's above, above average of a typical year. What? How, did, how are these house fires starting? Do you have any idea? Like, not oh, that you need just, to. It could be anything, you know. But I think like typically you see older houses start on fire, just because like obviously everything's older in them, electrical wise. You know, the whole. How old is old? Oh, God, that's like a good my house question. is 1952 is when it was built, I believe. Right, but. Has it been remodeled ever? Like, Uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like sometimes when they do that, they go and redo the electrical or, you know, some of those things that are fire enhancers maybe. But I feel like, I don't know, not a fire investigator, so I can't (laughs) answer that question. Is that a thing? Do we have a fire investigator? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Jack, isn't it? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Jack wears a lot of hats. He does. (laughs) I share. I couldn't be a firefighter. I couldn't be Jack. Yeah, yeah. Emergency weather response guy. Yeah, he's got a lot of hats. 
Yeah. We'll get him on here sometime. Talk to him about how he does it. Well, because I was talking to you one time, and I it, I don't think it was your first response, but you rolled up on a motorcycle accident. Yeah, that that was actually that was one of my first ones, probably. But yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you rolled up, and I mean the 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 gentleman had died. Yeah, and his leg was off. Yes. Yeah. Which. I, just talk to me a little bit about that. Like, as that, you roll up on this, what's going through your head? I mean, have you ever seen? I mean, yeah. Obviously, I, I'm not a guy for blood. No. No. Okay. So that's the first thing. Yep. Um, And then kind of after that, you know, it's, I feel like your emotions are more of, there's no more saving them. So it's like, how can you be the nicest that you can be to honor his body. Um, but actually in that situation, I was only really seen it for like a few minutes because then I had went and helped with the traffic issue because it was on a main highway. So I feel like that kind of just mellowed out the situation for me. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not a, not a blood guy really. But was, was it a motorcycle car accident? Yeah. In motorcycle versus car. Car was okay. People in the car were okay. Yeah. Yep. Just a yeah, motorcycle guy. Was there anyone at fault on that one, or was I don't, it just a? Yeah, I guess I don't. I don't really know the situation that it was, but I'm assuming it was just you know an accident. But. How many uh, intense situations like that have you come across, or do you really even keep track? Do you just serve? Kind of go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. I. I mean. I think in intense situations, any time that you have to enter a house, um, and I've only entered like one or two houses that, and they weren't big fires, they were just smaller fires, but I think it makes it more intense when the house is filled with smoke just because your visibility is zero. Have you had that experience? I've, I went in on one where I couldn't really see anything, and it mm-hmm. wasn't, a, it was just a bedroom upstairs, like a small electrical fire upstairs, so it was easily put out, but... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy when you're going upstairs and you don't know where the last one's at or you don't know where the top one's at. So, yeah. Was there anybody upstairs? Or were you, were you, what were you going in for? Were you going in to like try to put it out? Just to put the fire out. Yeah. Did what? There was no a, one in the house. Ah, yeah. Everyone yes. had got out. But did it have a truck arrived at that point? Or what did you have to put the fire out? Yeah. So, like, we can't enter a house unless there's like, obviously, trucks there people outside um and you have to enter with someone else so you and a partner go in together and you go in with a hose okay so that you can follow the hose out makes sense so makes a lot of sense yeah and obviously so you have water makes a lot of sense yeah yeah how cold is it or is it cold is it warm water i mean is it yeah, it's just straight out of. The, I mean, hose water. Yeah, hose water. Sixty, 60 degree, degree water. water. Yeah, which I figured that out with <laughs> doing the ice bath recently. Hose water comes out about sixty and or so, and uh, man, so you put that one out. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't the guy. You weren't the guy. I wasn't the guy. You weren't. I'm him. No, no. But but you. I were, I just yeah. I honestly just enjoy enjoy serving, um, and I probably would have never done it. If I wasn't with Sydney, hmm. I mean, I just I don't know if I would have ever done it, sure. but like I like the guys on it, and I like spending time with them, um, and just being a part of something in the community. I think is important. So, and that that's kind of where I found my place. Important to important to serve, or important to have important to have that camaraderie. Or? I think it's important to have the community involvement. You know, if you're going to be a member of our our society, I think there's plenty of ways to be involved in our community. Right. I just felt like this, right. that was the best fitting for me for now. Sydney joined first. Yeah. She was on for a year or two, probably two years before I was on. I think you've, I've seen you driving that thing, driving the big fire truck before. Yeah. She likes to be the big truck. <laughs> the that's awesome. How many people are on, how many people are, is it all volunteer or is there anybody that's like a paid? No, it's, it's all, all volunteer. All volunteer. Right on. Some some guys get paid. Like they're like our lead guys. Still volunteers. Yeah. 
but they and they'd get paid from the county then. Yep. No, city. City. So it's only a city of Jefferson firefighting. And then Grand Junction has their own and yeah. Peyton and Sheridan have their own and Yeah, but some of them aren't like actually involved with the city. They're like their own entity. Okay. Like I know that uh Grand Junction. Oh yeah, I don't know about Grand Junction. Like some like some of the smaller towns are kinda like their own entity rather than like the city paying for I mean obviously oh, sure. they're still like, like city employees. Yeah. Not being city employees. Interesting. Yeah. It's a whole it's a whole world, you know. And it's just you gotta have it. You gotta have somebody putting out fires. I mean, it's the oldest job in the world just about, right? You first yeah. responders is when stuff goes down. You've got the healers and you've got the people who are there, boots on the ground, right? Yeah. And do you know who Tim Kennedy is? Tim Kennedy, he's a he is a Green Beret, a decorated military guy, but he's always been a UFC fighter too. So he was in the MMA like way back when it started. He wrote a book where he talked about he's 17 or 18 and uh, as a first responder, and he had a really good teacher. They one time rolled up on an accident. And it was just like one of those life defining things that you experience where if you take yourself back, you can still see it. You can still smell it. You can still hear the sounds sort of a stuff. And it was like a church van had crashed. It was like 17 kids. Wow. And he said the the first thing that he noticed when he rolled up was he could smell everything, blood, urine, vomit, poop, all of it. Like it just, everything was excreted in a stress situation like right. that. Like, and smoke fires, Chaos, multi cars, lots of people, and ah, uh, it was formative for me to yeah. read about, which is not something that I've really been exposed to. But I'm very into um, on the topic of health right now, just like how you respond to stress. I think this is the key to like all all things because if you heard the quote about how life is ten percent what happens to you and ninety percent of how you respond to it, I feel like you're a calm, cool, collected guy like so i don't know about that now ang- I, I've, I've thought about this because how you respond to stress and the presence of anger are different because like when you fly off the handle I'm not saying that you do this i mean i think we all fly. have our moments we all have our moments yeah. right of flying off the handle because it just builds and builds and builds and builds but when something stressful happens to you someone dies you get injured fender bender or you lose your job or you get COVID and you spend two weeks in the hospital. Like those are more intense, some quick, some slow stress incidences, but it's all about how you respond to that, you know? Right. And I think the, uh, the people who live longest are not the worry warts, the, uh, high anxiety people, you know, the, I, I think this is my theory right now is like it, the, the more chill you can maintain when stress happens, the healthier you're going to be. Because stress, stress is the, is the, is a killer, you know, right. stress leads to so many, so many things. So that's my theory, you know, and would you say you're a calm, cool, collected guy? Or, I mean, you as a first responder, Sydney's shaking her head like she knows you're calm, cool, collected. Yeah. See, I don't think so. You don't think so? No. I think I can portray myself to be like while I'm around people. The fact that you can portray yourself to be almost tells me that you definitely are. Because if you can give a portrayal out that's different from what you're feeling, if you were if you were at mercy of the feelings, you wouldn't be able to portray calm, cool, collected. So there you have it. You don't have to be humble right here. You can just <laughs> no, be like, but yeah, I, I, I just what, don't think that's who I am. What have you got figured out is what I'm getting after. What what about life have you got figured out that's making you just tick along one day at a time? Mm. Working hard, building a family. Because if you, as I, the highest suicide demographic is young white males, our age, your age. Yep. Hmm. Where it's, you get this purposeless kind of like limbo out of high school, got to figure out what I'm going to do. You experience a stressor, you experience a loss, don't know how to handle it, don't have a good coping mechanism. I think I'd just rather not be here, you know? And then there's, then there's you. I've seen you go through some stressful things. I saw you go through, you know, pre-med into different career into I'm just going to come home and start working, you know? Yeah. I've seen you go through different things and yet here you are like just humming right along. I don't know. I just think that however you make it to be is how it's going to be. I mean, if there's always going to be bad situations and 
I mean, what are you going to take out of it? I mean, it's really bad to say, like, obviously, if you lose someone, like, I think grieving's a whole different deal, like, a whole different side of the spectrum. But, I mean, like, just your everyday, like, things are not always going to go your way. And I think that's honestly my biggest struggle is sometimes I have something so planned out and it just doesn't work. That That's what gets me. But I think that if you look back on the day and you're like, well, I got this, this, and this accomplished, you really don't have a bad day. So, I don't know, I would say, like, just appreciating, like, all the small moments. Like, just small accomplishments. It doesn't have to be major. Like, not have your goals so high that they're not reachable. Expectations. Yeah, like, just know that if you are steady at everything you do and keep moving forward, then eventually you're going to reach what you want to, you know. Yeah. Consistency. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what it is. I think that's the answer. Just beating the drum every day. Yeah. Chop wood, carry water. You heard of that book? <laughs> yeah. You have? Yeah. <laughs> you read it? I have not read it. But yeah. I've, like, you know. I've heard, like, references. That's uh, Matt Campbell's big thing a couple years ago yeah. was – Matt Campbell coached the Iowa State football team. His uh, he had the entire team read this book, uh, "Chop Wood, Carry Water," which Lindsay and Tyler. I was gonna say as soon as you said it, I almost said it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you bet. And uh, where it's just about you got to do. It's this guy who wants to be a uh, an archer, like a uh, a samurai archer. He's just this guy who wants to go be an archer, and the training is out in the like the beaten off the beaten path. They have electricity and things, but every day you have to go get your own water and you have to get wood for fire. So it's every single day you got to do these things. You have to chop wood, spend time hardening your body, getting strong, carrying water from up. And then when you do that day after day after day, it gets not necessarily easier, but you build a base of function that leads to higher achievement. And for like the first two years as they're practicing archery, they don't practice from farther than seven feet away. And it's like they want to shoot the long shots and this one guy, the main character, is he's frustrated with that. He wants to shoot longer shots. So the instructor takes him out and has him shoot. And he's he hits the target, but it's not dead on. So then right before he's about to shoot, he takes a stick and he moves his elbow just like an inch. And the arrow goes like way off target because he's shooting from far away. Aim small, miss small. Like he he took the aim off a little bit, but he missed by a mile. And that was the reason why you start from a close-up is because you're going to get that form so locked in to where once that's locked in, in the future when you have longer distances to shoot at, you're going to be the same form, the same technique. You're not going to miss by a mile because you have a flaw in your technique sort of a thing. Managing expectations sort of a thing. That's what you're you're reminding me of right here. I think that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For sure. I think that's anything you do. Managing expectations, consistency. Yeah. Yeah. That's just obvious to you. Just common sense in a way? No, I don't know. Or is there an experience that you have that taught taught you this, taught you the hard work ethic, taught you the consistency is king idea? Honestly, I think it was my high school football coach. Yeah? Yeah. I think, like, prior to him, Coach Moore, um, like, yeah, I, I think, honestly, it all goes back to high school sports. Sure. Because for you. Yeah, I, I think that's where I – like mm-hmm. kind of figured everything out you mm-hmm. can say um because like prior to him we, i obviously lifted weights no i didn't really know what i was doing or i didn't care that much to know what i was doing um and then kind of after him just like the discipline like the daily grind like you just learn to learn to love it i guess i mean because it wasn't easy and he didn't sugarcoat anything when he came in like he I remember the first day meeting him. He just pretty much said, this is how it's going to be. So you're either going to buckle down and grind it out or you're just. Or maybe this isn't for you. Yeah. I mean, I, that was kind of the his idea behind it. Uh, Coach Moore. Yeah. Which, right on. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, how many years did you have him? Two. Junior and senior year? Yeah. Yeah. And junior year was, I mean. Junior year, our our record did not reflect any different than the previous years. We still only won one game. 
So but, there, there's something behind the way that he went about coaching. Because when you go through a year of what we did of 5 a.m. practices, 5 a.m. workouts, four days a week, year-round, through the winter, doesn't care. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in wrestling, if you're in basketball, it doesn't care if you're track. Like, he wanted you to do all these other sports, but you were still going to go to 5 a.m. lifting. Like There was just no exceptions. So I feel like you go through a year of that, then you have the season we did, 1-8. and eight. What about the way that he was coaching? Was he able to get everyone to stay bought in the following year? That's a great question. Because nobody nobody left. Nobody, I mean, obviously the senior class was gone. Right. But, like, why did we keep, I mean. You all kept after it. Right. Your class, your senior class. Yeah. You were dedicated to the process. Right. How many games did you win your senior year? Eight. You went. You were one and eight, and then you went eight and eight one. And one. Made or the playoffs. Eight, eight and two. Yeah, after sure. the playoff loss. Right on. Big switch. Yeah, but I think like there's something more than just the athletic ability of the team, like because nobody changes that quickly with no. the same the same talent. No, no. And he was. I mean, he was the trust the process guy. Sure, I and mean, that's what he preached. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that goes into like your everyday life. Like you're not your end goal is here, but you're not gonna just wake up one day and reach that. Like Right. There's every day is part of the process. Right. So I think if you take that out of your sports, like the success we had through that and the hardships obviously from the previous year, and you take that into your everyday life, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. There are going to be setbacks. There's going to be adversity you have to face. But how are you going to handle it? What are you going to do to better the situation? Was Coach Moore, was he kind of preaching this through the context of life? Yeah. I like, Honestly, I think like a lot of his preaching like had nothing to do with football. It's interesting. Like, yeah. It was just, I mean, yeah, it all correlated and, and was in relation to football in some way, but like, if you really sit back and think about what he was talking about and what he was driving us to do, it had nothing to do with, you know, being a good football player. It was all about life. It was all yeah. about this is the way it really is. Right. Yeah. And because this is the way it really is, we're going to practice football like we should be living life, essentially. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't just like lifting to him. It wasn't just about conditioning. And like he had, we had great relationships with our coach. And I think that's important. Um, and then besides that, it was, like, nutrition. Um, it was huge. Like, if he caught you drinking a soda, walking down the hallway, like, it was a no-go. Oh, I love that. But, I, I mean, that. so I think that it was more than just more than just being a good football coach or a right good on. football player. Like, I think he was trying to – he wanted us to succeed after football. You feel like a lot of you in that senior class have succeeded in your in your arena of profession or whatnot. Do you feel like? It- yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, the crazy part is, is that you leave high school and you lose a lot of connections. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that for me was just because I chose not the college route after a couple of years. So, your you and your high school friends are living way two different lifestyles because you're out in the real world. You know, in their college, they're still in the college world, and it is different. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of like I lost some connections with a lot of my high school friends. Or I mean, yeah, I still talk to them here and there. You know, I hang out with a couple of my close friends, but it's not like not like it was, I feel like. Because right, you're not living the same life Yeah, together like I just anymore. feel like we're yeah. at two different parts of life, mm-hmm. um, and it's okay. Totally. Yeah. That's the way it, that's the way it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Right on. So there's not necessarily like, oh, yeah, everyone from that class is like super successful because we learned how to live playing football in that that year. I think we just learned how to like learn how to live our own lives. Well, which is even better. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. it's not like we all felt like we had to go do the same thing or, you know, like all be together. Like we were all spread out. We graduated and we I felt like kind of all spread it out, you know. Did our own thing. And success, the 
it's all about how you define success too, because I think maybe it was just younger Philip thought success was largely financial based. And the more I've grown up, I realized like that's not the case whatsoever. Like finances is just one small part of a success, but b living life at all. Anyway, you know, I, I would define success as like, how's your relationships? You know, how's your, how's your health? Are you, do you, (laughs) how are your resources? Where's your energy at? I probably, my currency of energy is almost more valuable to me than, than money. Obviously money is like, there's no replacement for that. You're not going to pay the bills with your own heart and energy and willpower, you know, but like, I feel like sometimes people that, I mean, clearly there's people that, you know, have money. Yes. But like, I feel like sometimes they're just can be grumpy or they're always on edge. Mm -hmm. Like, I think back, I'm like, if I had that money, would I be that grumpy? But, I mean, if you're right, if their relationships aren't there, if they're, yeah, I mean, if they're solely just trying to find happiness through the currency of a dollar, then it would make sense. There's this one guy I was listening to on a podcast. It's just a clip. Everything's in clips now, you know, yeah. reels and short videos. And he, uh, he's actually a controversial fellow. Do you know Dan Blitzerin, I think is his name? Very controversial guy. It's probably good that you I don't know if I do or not. Don't necessarily know him. But uh he he maybe inherited a lot of money and I think he managed it well and he made more money. But he makes a comment like I'm worth three hundred and fifty million dollars, but like I'm not happy because I have that. And he talks about how when you buy one thing, it gets you a high. Right. But then eventually it's like you gotta keep buying things in more extravagant or like you bought this, now I need this. And they oh, they have that. So I I need this as well to like maintain my happiness level from stuff. So finally someone asks him like, what does make you happy? And he goes, surfing, hanging out with my friends, connection, you know, like community, which is why I think it's awesome that you and Sydney are volunteer firefighters of, of, of the many things you do, like your social butterflies, I'd say. But, uh, are you, you are, you like your social outings and gatherings and things like that. Yeah. Connection, that's wealth right there. Not wealth in the traditional sense of what's your bank account say, but wealth of like quality of life. Yeah. I feel like that's missed. Where's that on Instagram? Where's that on uh, on social media for a 12 year old? Apparently not. They want you to buy this and buy that. And yeah, it's always what the next best deal is. Totally. (laughs) Totally. Advertisers are all over all that stuff, sort of a thing. And I, yeah, I'd like to scream it from the mountaintops just what real wealth, what real health looks like you know and i think the world would be different yeah i think you'd have young young white men who aren't uh aren't committing suicide at the same rate you know and there's this other guy i listen to a lot of stuff let's do a lot of stuff do Do you uh peter atia is his name brilliant doctor kind of turned into a he was a surgeon was a uh medical doctor worked at like john hopkins and then is not whistleblowing on health, but he's just taking a new approach to what health is. And he says like the, the substance abuse and suicide rate from COVID like tripled like a crazy, a crazy, crazy amount. So just the, the lockdowns and the masks and the inability to have any connection. You don't have any connection. I I'm, I'm bent on this is like a massive part of health that, Every MD, every DC, every, chiro- every 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 chiropractor, every clinician should it should be part of your protocol. If you're prescribing anything, if you're giving any therapy, hey, are you connecting with anyone today? Also, hey, are you getting eight hours of sleep? Like sleep is the best. Sleep is the best. If you're not sleeping, just go to sleep. Just yeah. If you can't sleep, find somebody to help you sleep. Don't necessarily take all the drugs to do that, but sleep is the greatest supplement right there. Yeah. But it sounds like, again, you're living that life. You're 23 years old. You're living beyond your years, you know? Yeah. Is it because you've figured, you've cracked the code, or it's no, just, I this is just cracked a, no code. You're just being you right now. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I like the people that I'm surrounded by. And I feel like we have, like, Sydney and I have a wide range of, like, huge groups that we socialize in. I mean... Like, we hang out at our dad's a lot, and, like, he has some get-togethers, you know, and that's, like, all older 
his the age. old guys. Like grandpas. Sure. I guess you could say. <laughs> so I hang out with that, and then we hang out with, I mean, guys your age. I mean, you're not that much older, but you're older than us. So I feel like we have, like, a wide range of people that we connect with. Mm-hmm. So I think that gives us a lot of options and resources to, I mean, just hanging out with them. Like, you learn a lot of things about maybe their struggles through life um, when they were our age and, like, you know, so I yeah. think that you, if you take all that into consideration, then, I mean, you can learn something from them. Every day. Yeah. From different connection points. Right. Is there any one story that sticks out to you? Anything that you've come across that's been like, oh man, this guy, what a story you're just inspired by? Even personal or just anything you've heard on social media or anything? Oh, that's a tough question. That's what it's here for, unfiltered podcast, yeah, tough I questions. Know. I mean, may, I don't know if I retain enough information. Putting you on the spot, too, it's always, it's yeah. always hard. Um, I don't know, not one that I can, like, that just comes to mind right away, I guess. Do you have another formative experience that you would say, like, there was, like, last week, uh, Mary Peterson, there was, she read a book, and it, like, a light bulb went off in her mindset, and I asked her, so there was Mary Peterson before this book and there was Mary Peterson after this book. And she said, yes, pretty much. Do you have an experience like that? Junior, senior year football, there was Bryce Hoyle before football. There's Bryce Hoyle after football. I think Bryce Hoyle and football, college football, and then Bryce Hoyle after football. That was the I think pinnacle. that's the breaking line. Because, I, I mean, like I don't know what drove me to play college football or – Play. I mean, I only played for one season, but like I thought my whole life revolved around sports for the longest time, like because that's what I did growing up, sports all through high school, played sports. And then and I got into college and like I thought that when I left college football that I would have just been so like down on myself. Like I felt like I would have had like a sense of regret. Like, after it kind of, like, went through, like, I wish I was still there. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have that because I felt like I started enjoying other things in life. Because, like, for so many years, I woke up, I, I did sports, and I went to bed. Like, that was just – so I think that being able to find other enjoyments in life and not relying on, like, solely relying on sports mm-hmm. um, to get enjoyment out of it. I mean, obviously, there was – things I did that I enjoyed while I played sports. But I feel like that was like your the sole drive and why I did what I did. And being able to like get out and expand and like find things that you had never done and that you enjoy or um, I don't know. I think just being able to choose your destiny. Ooh. That's kind of. Having the freedom to do that. Yeah. Like. Not feeling like you were relying on something to to make you successful, but being able to kind of carve your own path. There was a breakthrough in that where it's the freedom yeah. from from sports. If sports isn't what makes me successful. I can have that in a Outside lot of side of it. Yeah, it's a big. I deal. think that was the breaking point. Yeah, like made me realize that it, sports weren't gonna be everything for my whole life. Like at some point, I was gonna have to hang it up. And everyone needs that experience in a way, right? Like, Well, I think everyone goes through that experience. I mean, you think about, like, take an NFL player, for instance, how many years they've con- – I mean, like, that is what they do. Um, so, like, I feel like even at that point, I mean, that's – in their mind, at some point, they have to hang it up. Like, it's just – you cannot keep playing any longer. So, like, I feel like being able to understand that and maybe – I don't know, like, for me, like, getting out of that, those shoes was like, important for me to, like, drive to the rest of my career or the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, discover your purpose. Yeah. And, and yeah. honestly, just, like, a change, like, being able to accept change, I think it's big because, like, sometimes I feel like people just live in the past too much or, like, they struggle because they can't get their mind out of the past, but being able to just move forward and... Yeah, yes. it's huge. That's funny because me and uh, Andy, we share a lot of high school sports experiences. 
and we will recall them on occasion and our wives i don't think they even say anything now they just go like turn the page <laughs> <laughs> like yeah you're right you know turn the page but i think it's good to reflect on it though good i mean there's definitely good memories from those years so yes i think it's good to share them yes indeed we honestly just can't believe that you guys can remember such detail from high school memories specifically sports <laughs> yeah yeah there's some things you just can't forget which is why i'm a huge component of uh kids playing sports or music or any activity because you will experience things you've never experienced i've never experienced pain until uh until we were doing one of those drills where it's like hey you've got the ball and you're going that way and you're the defender and you're going to stop him yeah alan fisher he uh he was a tank he was built and uh, he had the ball i had to tackle him and i was like a stinger i had a stinger i've never experienced pain before until that that exact moment yep I can still see where we were in the field. I can still like kind of feel the pain. I, I mean, I went and walked it off, and I had tears in my eyes, and I just couldn't breathe. Yeah, I remember all that. I remember all that. I remember yeah. Alan being like, "Yeah, good hit," <laughs> pat me on the helmet. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> let's not do it again. <laughs> I'm out. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I guess I remember sort of like things. injuries and stuff like that, but you guys will be like, remember when this guy ran that route and then he threw the ball and we got the touchdown. <laughs> and we're all like, mm, no. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe those are special, just special yeah, moments, you yeah. know, special formative moments. Like you got to be a part of it to appreciate it. You do, right. Yeah. That means you were a part of it. Yeah. You were there. You were right. present. Right. Got to be present. Can't be stuck living in the past or the future. Got to be where you are. That's how you remember things, I think. You just need to be present more, Lindsay. Jeez. I, just, I didn't understand football until probably like last year. Yeah. So hearing anybody talk about any sort of football play, I was like, oh, there's a ball. And when you get it to that end of the field, it's a touchdown. Yeah. <laughs> what was your formative uh, activity? Volleyball. Volleyball. Oh, yeah. You understood volleyball. Yes. There's Lindsay Waffen pre-volleyball <laughs> and Lindsay Waffen post-volleyball. Yeah. Yeah. But short volleyball career because I – Kept dislocating my knee, but you got flexi joints. I do. Yeah, you're not normal. They're a mess. <laughs> what else are you watching, reading, listening to? Do you consume media, or are you kind of a wake up work? I don't know. We don't. We don't watch the news. I don't. I mean, no. Netflix. Yeah. Movies. Are you a movie? Movie. Like it's nighttime. We're gonna relax on the couch. Yeah, we got a show once in a while. Yeah. We'll watch together. Yeah. You got anything right now that you're doing? We just finished uh, the Lincoln Lawyer, the TV series, right? Yeah. Yep. It was pretty good. Yeah. I kind of like those, like I don't know, almost like the reality, like real life deals. Like it was obviously fiction- fictional, but kind of like the real life settings of court and all that. Like I feel like it's always yeah, versus fantasy land yeah. or. Outer space stuff, or yeah, I actually, sci-fi. I actually, speaking of which, I've watched a TV series called Suits. I've heard a lot about Suits <laughs> recently. Do you yeah, watch yeah. it? Uh, I know enough to know the reference. I but, think um, that you can, like, I think you can get something out of it. Ooh, do tell. So there's this kid um, that graduates high school, and uh, he's really intelligent, but he never goes to Harvard to go to law school, but people pay him to take the bar test for him, for them. Oh, wow. Because he's got, like, photographic memory. So, like, he could just look at it once. He knew all the answers. He'd go pass all these tests for these kids. Well, one day he went to the, I mean, like, the highest law firm and interviewed and just straight up told this guy, like, I don't have a degree, but he's like, open up your, like told the guy of the law firm, the lawyer, he's like, open up your book and ask me any question. And he like does, and this kid just rattles everything off. And then the lawyer like gets upset about it. So he like closes this computer thinking like he's going to rattle off just like the kid is like, and the kid's like, no, you, you missed a part. Oh, <laughs> So okay. So, goes on, and this guy ends up hiring this kid over all the other 
like actual certified to be a first year assistant without a without, without a, a lawyer's yeah. So they thought they were gonna keep this on the down low, like be their little secret. Oh, but then he turns out that he is a really good lawyer because he's like he's smart enough to do it. He understands all that, but he just never went and got certified. Like he wasn't legal, and uh, the lawyer still believed in him, like. And they still kept it a secret. But when it came down to, like, someone was going to find out, they cheated. Mm. Like, he knew how to break in to get his name in Harvard's files and knew how to get his name to be a certified on the bar and all this stuff. So, like, they always, instead of doing things the right way, they always found the loopholes to get around it. And at the end, it ended up coming back and kind of bite him in the butt. Like, he knew all along. He had, like, through the series, he had several opportunities to walk away. Mm. To be like, no, this isn't right that I'm doing it and that I should just walk away. And at one point, he was actually getting, like, in a criminal lawsuit for him being... Practicing law without a law degree. Yes. Right. But then, like, he finds a way to get out of it. Because he always, like, I feel like cause they were a big corporate law firm. Mm. So, like, I feel like there's just some sketchy stuff that always goes on in corporate world. Makes you wonder, right? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on What do they like, really get away with type mm-hmm. deal? But I just feel like if he would have just done it the right way the first time, like, he would have been that good of a lawyer sure. legally. Yeah. So, like, sometimes instead of taking the shortcuts – to try to get where you want to be, you're going to have that major setback because you didn't take all the proper steps. And I think, I mean, I think that was a really good point. Maybe they weren't trying to make, but that I kind of seen out of it because, like, there was just so many opportunities this kid had just to escape and be free. And to... There we are. We made it a long time. We did. Not bad. <laughs> Hungry. Hungry. Yeah. yeah. Got to eat. Baby's got to eat. But I feel like that was, like, yeah. there was just several opportunities for this kid to just be fresh, start fresh. Do the right thing. I mean, he could have went and done the right thing, but he just always got sucked right back into, you know, his end goal and how fast could he get there. I like that stuff. I like shows that have some 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 meaning, some depth to yeah. it. I'm all about the depth. Absolutely. That's good. Suits, you heard it here. Netflix, get after it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good deal. Yeah, might as well. There you go. Anything else? Are you a podcaster? Are you a, are you a listener to that sort of stuff? I don't. I don't. No. I don't know. I don't find myself listening to much. A lot of times, I feel myself driving. And I'm like, I could turn on the radio. <laughs> like I just Get drive in silence. I don't know. Silence. You prefer silence. Yeah. A little decompression time is always yeah, good. Maybe. I don't know. I like talking on the phone. Sydney would probably tell you that. Do you My call? phone's always ringing. And it's people that, calling you or oh well, yeah, but it's not always business related. Sure, like uh, there's just people that we check in with each other every day, kind of just see what's going on. Connection, yeah. So I think that I don't know if I'm driving. I'm usually just talking on the phone. There you go. So yeah, I would say that's my enjoyment out of the day. Making your own podcasts, one conversation <laughs> at a time. Yes, I could be. You should be Start recording, recording these. <laughs> yeah. Just. <laughs> I don't know if everyone probably wants to hear what we talk about. <laughs> yeah, what would you call it? Bryce thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Bryce is I probably wouldn't have very many viewers. <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. Stuff like that sometimes goes goes viral. It could. It could. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love it. Thank you. No, I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure we'll do it again. I, Sydney's a candidate to be on. Yeah. Could have hooked her up right here. You know? Shut up. We'll give you baby duty next yeah. next week. Sid can come on, talk about talk about life and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Get another ice bath then. And- you betcha. Colder this time. Yeah. Colder. I just had a buddy tell me he likes his at 44 degrees. The coldest I've been How in. How so precise? He, uh, I think he's got a system where you like, uh, he's either got a chiller. I know he's got a chiller. Okay. And he either like chills it until it's at a certain point or, I mean, now they've got things where you can set the temp. And it'll go until it's that cold and then shut off. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, like, 
would it be easier on your body to get in when it's 60 and then you're chill or chill it down to oh man there's a thought i would rather do it that way but i think the shock is probably where you get the health benefit correct yeah correct yeah yes the stress level reaction like indeed how fast can you bring your stress down so that you can manage what's happening there's an amazing podcast by Huberman Labs that's all about, uh, he's honestly amazing about any topic. He's got all the research. I'm in the middle of this ice bath podcast right now. He's got one on dopamine, which I feel like is super important. Yeah. Your dopamine from an ice bath increases the same amount as when you take cocaine. An ice bath and cocaine increase the dopamine in your brain the same amount, except after cocaine, it peaks after 10 minutes. And in a... Uh, I may have said this last week. If I did and you're listening, I'm sorry that I <laughs> don't have fresh stuff. An ice bath, it peaks after two, and a, two hours. So 10 minutes after cocaine, two hours after an ice bath. So you get a longer high from an ice bath than you do from drugs. So That's like, interesting. Very. Yeah. Very. Absolutely. So it'll, but it'll, like cocaine, you're going to have a crash. So what's a crash off an ice bath? I'm not sure because it's all about how fast you you uh, handle dopamine in your brain. Some right. people are faster, some people are slower. So it's you might have a crash if it spikes and goes down that much, but it's uh, it's much slower with an ice bath. Hmm. Slow rise, slow fall. I feel like you're just sleepy. You feel that way? Yeah. Whenever I have done it, like right after or like four hours Probably after, like an hour and a half, two hours after. I which am, would track. I am just lit. <laughs> I'm just lit. Maybe you're a fast de- uh, decreaser of dopamine. I think I have ADHD, which would be a fast dopamine processor. Sure. It's quick hits off of everything, but everything falls off really fast. So that would make sense for me. But It's a big deal. Yeah. Super big deal. <laughs> Dig into that ADHD topic sometime too. But Just start living on an ice bath then. I <laughs> live on the high <laughs> or what? Maybe. I I think it's a great thing to it? Live in it. Live in the ice. But ah, that might be <laughs> pushing it. <laughs> Hypothermia is very real. Say, five minutes. Five minutes is enough. Five minutes is enough. That's yeah. my norm right now. That's Forty-seven impressive. to fifty-two degrees is what I'm doing. That's a big jump from what you were doing previously. I know. I've working it up. Adaptability is what I'm after. You know, making myself handle stress better, which is really what really got me into the stress. Having you on as a guest, being a first responder, some of those experiences. Figuring out how you handle stress is that's what the ice bath is really about is helping you handle stress so that when you're in a situation that's redlining you, you can handle it better. I think the ice bath mentally and physically can. So do you think I I noticed that you have a timer set up so you can see it? Do you think that helps you or makes it worse? I don't know. Currently, I'd say help help just because. But if you didn't know where time was. How could you tell yourself? I mean, if you couldn't see the time, you don't know how long you've been in there. Correct. It's probably better to not be. It's right? harder. Because if you're sit, well, I, I don't know. I feel like if you're sitting there, you're watching seconds go by. Like you're wishing time away. You're I don't know. wishing for it to be over. Some people talk about how the ice bath is addicting, and I feel like I'm that way right now. Where yeah. I, yeah. I want I want to be in it right now, and I I didn't think I'd get to be this way, but I have. So a timer right now, I don't know. Do I just th- like knowing. I know, but do you think if you say you didn't have a timer, how long do you think you would actually sit in it before you got out? I'm not sure. Do you think you'd make it the full five minutes or not? I think I'd. I don't know. We'll have to do this experiment. Yeah. I think out of fear of not going long enough, I would end up going longer. Too long. Yep. Yeah. That it'd be six, seven minutes. And today when we did it. You think you're mentally tough enough to, to get through that? Or we'll see. Yeah. That's what know. it's for. I mean, yeah. That's what it's for. I mean, I, yeah, I want that mental toughness. Yeah. I had a terrible time doing ice baths in college. Couldn't handle it at all. First couple, I think when I did it with Lindsay's husband, yeah. it was like, can you make it warmer for me? Just so I can <laughs> like get one in, just yeah. get one done. And, uh, now we're ready to roll. We had good t- we had good times in high school in the ice bath. It's a special. It's a special. I mean, it was it was fun. You got to make had it like, fun. Yeah, I mean, like you had eight guys just all jumping in the ice bath. Big a big a big, big thing. Yeah, big it stock was a tank. big tank. Yeah. yeah, yeah, special times. So it was. Yeah, 
Anybody wants to try an ice bath, you hook me up. Bryce is a king at it. 52 <laughs> degrees, didn't bat an eye. Wasn't even shivering. That's a pretty good. It's a, it's a decent temp, but it's all about what you can handle and where you're at. So We'll test it. We'll see how low we can go. Indeed, we will. Winter's coming. I was going to say, you guys can come over when it's 10 degrees outside and see how it goes. <laughs> Tyler's got a nice setup. Indeed, we'll do that. Right on. Bryce, thanks. Thank you. Love it. Appreciate it. Next episode. Signing off. Catch you later. Thank you.